Hi everyone. Salam alaikum. That's that's it. That's all I can. But I hope I did good. So trust. Um, trust is why we are here. Trust is why I'm here. Uh, in several forms, in several matters, and especially when it comes to impact to our economical growth. Uh, Trust is really what brought me here and made me fly 9,000 kilometers from Brazil, where I'm from, to this beautiful country, and made me actually trust... Trust? The ticker, yeah. So trust my two most precious things that I have in my life, which are my two babies, to those crazy ladies here. Not because they are most, the most well-prepared persons to take care of babies, but, but because they are my mothers. They are my mom-in-law and my mom. And I'm pretty sure that throughout those 10 days that I will be out for the first time, and my wife, uh, they will take care of them. And because they trust their principles, and because they trust they will do whatever it takes. Uh, in the last five years, there was a lot in terms of packaging trust, packaging reputation, uh, scoring how much should someone trust you in particular scenarios. It changes the way that we buy things, it changes the way that we connect with people, it changes the way that we borrow money with Kickstarter, for instance. Even some banks now are giving you loans based on your Facebook profile or your social media store. So a lot has changed. So definitely, trust-based innovation it's a reality, and it's, it's, there, there are things that are impacting our currency and our growth and the way that we exchange money and our measuring trust. However, I, I was lucky enough to spend the last 10 days working with companies, big and small and government, to understand how innovation impacts the economic growth. And if there's one learning that I had is that more than trust-based innovation, trust sparks innovation. It's almost this intangible factor that can make a difference between one country succeed in their economic growth with innovation and others don't. Uh, and, and again, I think the best way to summarize this is that trust works like a fertilizer for innovation. Like, every single idea that we might have, if we don't trust that idea, if we are not on an environment of trust, this idea might, might not grow like a plant. How many here had at least once an idea that you think could really become a business? Please, raise your hands. And keep the hands raised, only the ones that actually implemented. So, and, and trust has, has a lots of variables. There's the, the optimism of trust that I heard so many times during this day, like, we need to trust ourselves, we need to trust others, and they are all true and super important. But they're also our relationship with failure. Failure should not be considered a bad thing. And for me, as a Latin person, I can say it, my culture doesn't do failure well. We are ashamed of it. We don't like to fail. We, we, we don't tell people that we actually fail. Where when you go to cultures where this, this environment of trust is in place, people are proud of their failures. Because they understand that that failure, they learned something, and they grew, I don't trust that fly. I really don't. So, and, and they, they trust that flair, and they know that this will take them faster to a better place. So, oops. Another thing that we also have to consider is that sometimes it's super easy to know, okay, I'm going to innovate, I'm going to do something, really, on a time of crisis like this. And like a, again, like a, a ground that is fertilized, actually, times of bare economies and crises are the perfect soil for innovation. More than half of the Fortune 500 companies were actually created in times of financial crisis. And the reason why is because they don't do the same. They, they came 
and they challenge the status quo. I repeat that, challenge the status quo. Who here is living in a time that we, all are, we are all challenging the status quo? Right? So this is the perfect time, and it's not new for anybody of us. Like, we, we, we did this before. There's also a very important point that I became aware when I saw the audience. Who here will look for jobs in the next two years? The first job. That's cool. So we were all also educated. Listen, go for security. Go for the big companies, right? Uh, and as a matter of fact, although big companies hire big quantities of people, they are very susceptible to crises and fluctuations in the environment, where young companies, small companies, are not volatile at all. Th this graphic shows the number of jobs generated in the last 50 years. So during crises, you can see that some, you have the, 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 the line that goes up and down are the jobs generated by big companies. And the line that does not fluctuate are actually the jobs generated by companies with less than five years. So it's almost like a message to our government. You want to create jobs? Foster innovation. Foster entrepreneurism. Foster an environment of trust. Is there a secret sauce that we can do all this? Probably not, but there are some common things. The first one that I notice in all successful companies that I work with is really, again, to trust yourself, but trust your dreams. But know that with big dreams, there will come big problems. There's now this phenomenon of people trying to create new ideas and new startups that are cool, right? They need to be social, they need to have a consumer thing, and, and that's fine, but do not, do not make a mistake in the sense that if you are tackling or addressing a big problem, it doesn't matter what you do, you will be the coolest person, the coolest company in, in, in around because you are addressing something that is big and go for those big problems and trust yourself and have tenacity, which is a very important characteristic when you trust people. Trust doesn't come from yesterday and it's not something that once you get it, it will remain forever. You need to fight every day. You need to convince yourself. You need to convince others that you do believe in what you do. A great example of a startup that I, I was uh, able to help was from Dr. Kuling. He basically was one of the people that uh, created the Polaroid instant uh, film. How many people here still use those Polaroids, right? It's a doomed business. It's, it's nobody, nobody does this anymore. But instead of just giving up, he believed in the skills that he has, which is basically, forget about Polaroid. It's a piece of paper with chemical agents that developed a film. With that same set of skills, he went and looked for a big problem. For instance, health, and access to health, and access to blood exams that require chemical agents. So he basically used his experience and created a business card size blood exam. He transformed his skills in something that now is serving or can serve billions of people around the world. So this card can take 20 plus types of blood exams, and it's the same kind of technology learning from one to the other. He went big, he believed in himself, and he did it even from an uh, adverse industry. The second thing, and I think it's super pertinent, especially here in Tunisia, where y you live a very multicultural and multidisciplined uh, uh, culture. And this is, this is a very strong strength for you when you go and try to innovate something. Welcome difference is the only way that you can actually innovate. You put 10 people that think alike in one room, they probably will do this thing very well. They will not innovate. If you don't mix gender, if you don't mix uh, ethnic background, if you don't mix technical background, it's very hard for you to actually come up with something that will be big. And in order to do this, it's vital that we can trust each other, that we can trust different opinions, that we believe in our opinion that although it might be different, I might have a point. Uh, a great example of this is, um, and I'll tell two stories and combine. Uh, Saudi Arabia has a 
and other countries in the region, they have a very interesting problem, which are the sand dunes. They take over roads, cities, you cannot stop them. The way that the sand mixed up, they just walk like a snake and just cover everything on their path. Uh, they tried everything, even crude oil, to stop it. Not the most financial or ecological uh, way, but they actually did it. Let's park that for a second. In my country, in Brazil, there's uh, more than half of our fuel is, is ethanol-based from sugarcane. From the by-process of creating the ethanol, there's a thing that missed, which is we call bagasso. And from this bagasso, there's an oily substance and there's a polymer that has the same or similar qualities than crude oil. And fast forward two years, the engineer that was working on this process was invited in Dubai to work for a different fuel process. And when they analyzed both components, they said, hey, wait a second, there's a country over there there's, there's something that is trash. This by, byproduct here that I mentioned is, is biodegradable, but it's trash, it's not used for anything. So literally, they are now stopping the dunes using what in one country is considered trash to send for the other one. And the only reason why this happened was because in Dubai, they have a multidisciplinary team, and this, and she, which is a, she's a female, she is an engineer, she was hired for this team to think in the different ways to tackle the same problem. Uh, the third thing, I would say that it's the small is the new big. With the amount of technologies that we have on our hands today, brute force is not equal more innovation. It doesn't, doesn't need, you don't need a hundred engineers to come up with the next big idea. You need to come up with a big idea and the resources to execute it. Um, there's, and, and I'm not saying that big corporations or big companies are not innovating. One analogy that I always like to do is insert the, the dimension of time. It's like big companies, they, they play chess before they, they will innovate something. They, they know what move they should do, but then they think about it and they think about it again, and then they play one. Where startups and young companies, they play poker. Like, you throw a hand, you lose it, you throw it again, you throw it again, you throw it again, and then you get the big hand. You risk it, you go for it. And we are in a time that we should be playing much more poker than, than chess. And it's very hard for big companies to play poker. It's easy to say, but it's easier when you're small, when you're lean, when you're mean, when you're hungry to do things. Uh, as a matter of fact, big companies are now trying to mimic small teams. At Amazon, for instance, uh, we, we have a policy in which we call the two pizza team. No team inside Amazon is bigger than your ability to feed all of them with two pizzas. So basically, you need to create a multidisciplinary team of six, five, seven people with the designer, the database guy, the developer, the leader, and they make all the decisions they need to make. And the only thing that they listen is the customer, the market need, and then they deliver, deliver, deliver. Their ability to launch big things, it's less, but that's fine, because then you can do incremental innovation. And you trust each other, and you collaborate because that's the only way that you can actually tackle the same big problems that up to date, only big companies were able to do it. So, I think if we could say that there's a secret sauce or something that are common ingredients, I would say that look for big problems and trust your ability and have tenacity to pursue them. Welcome different thinking. Believe in your different thinking. And last but not least, use the technologies that are available today to have this different approach, to really go fast and lean and try and make mistakes and learn through those mistakes. So before I finish, I would like to leave you guys with a, with a thought, which is in, in those environments, it's a very interesting thing, in those environments where this cultural uh, environment exists, the number of new companies that are generated every year 
does not change. In the US, for instance, is around 600,000 new companies from all verticals, technology, et cetera, are created every year. Out of this 600,000 companies, 1,000 of them, they, have, they achieve actually a million dollars in the first two years. So it's what we call at least one million dollars. It's what we call the high potential ones. And they are responsible for 1% of the entire GDP of a country. In the case of US, we're talking about 15 trillion. It's 150 billion dollars in the hands of 1,000 companies that have less than two years. Suddenly, this whole conversation about creating a trust environment, fostering innovation and entrepreneurship, and having an economical impact becomes a much more manageable number. So what is the number for Tunisia? How many companies we need to foster, protect, nurture, to make sure that they will be the next generation of companies, employers, job generation, generators, innovators? Who needs to be part of this group to find and nurture those companies? It's our education organizations, it's our government, it's the big companies that we already have in our countries, it's the global companies that want to make business here. You want to make business here? You help me find those companies. If you have a big idea, you welcome different uh, thinking, and you are not afraid to risk, I would love to be part of this and help you. Shukran.